In this episode of Creative Christians, film scholar Dr. Philip Holy joins me to discuss meaning in films. A typical one for me was The Redemption of Henry Myers. It was a Western. The redemption mm. was kind of him straightening his own life out yeah. more than any divine act of God. Yeah. You know, I watched that and I, I kind of go, well, wait a minute. This does raise a question. Mm-hmm. Do I need Jesus to have died on a cross if I can do it myself? Right. And uh, so in that case, I think it raised a question it didn't mean to raise. That's film scholar Dr. Philip Holy today on Creative Christians. My name is Tim Risto. I'm a creative, a filmmaker and writer. I'm also a Christian. Many of my friends are also Christian creatives, writers, filmmakers, actors, musicians, photographers, and artists. Who are these people, and how does their faith infuse their creativity? These are stories of creative Christians. And welcome to another episode of Creative Christians, the podcast series that explores Christian creatives, their talents, their faith, and what they're doing at the intersection of both. I'm your host, Tim Risto. Thank you so much for tuning in to listen once again. Today, we're continuing our interview with filmmaker and film scholar, Dr. Philip Holy. If you haven't heard part one of my interview with Phil, I'd highly encourage you to go back and listen to it. You'll get a full introduction of who Phil is. In part one, we really focused on Phil's role as filmmaker. But today, here in part two, we're going to focus primarily on Phil as a film scholar and look at film analysis. There's a little crossover here, so we do get into a few elements of him yet as filmmaker. But uh, but primarily, Phil's going to take us on a journey through film analysis. So let me ask you this. Have you ever watched a film and wondered, what did I just watch? You know, what, what was the meaning of that film? What was the director or the screenwriter or actors? You know, what were they trying to say with that film? What really was the meaning of it? Well, Phil's going to give us some insight into how filmmakers convey meaning in their movies. Now, Phil's got a few books out that talk about how to use some lenses, so to speak, to better interpret and understand the meaning in movies. We are going to talk about a lot of films today, Uh, some briefly, some more in depth, but we are going to reference a number of films along the way, and you're likely going to find perhaps a few new movies that you'll want to check out as well. But first, before we get into any of that, I ask Phil about some of the 20-something-odd jobs he's held in his life prior to settling into film and academics. You've actually held lots of different jobs and served in a variety of different roles and settings in your life before you came to some of these other roles. Can't keep a job. (laughs) (laughs) I've got the list here of some of the things, you know, vacuum cleaner salesman. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That I, someday I want to write a, a novel or at least a short story about that experience that summer. (laughs) I mean, I, literally the strangest things happen. I remember, you know, the summertime, the doors were open. We were often in poor neighborhoods that, you know, the vacuum cleaner is worth more than the carpet. Right. Um, so, but anyway, I remember knocking on the door and, and inside there was music playing and it was that song. I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. And I've got, I'm just kind of scratching my head. I said, what's the chances of that? Well, nobody ever came to the door. I went to the next one and there was music playing there too. And it was Paul McCartney's somebody's knocking at the door. Somebody (laughs) ringing the bell. And I said, this is too weird. Uh, I got to get out of this business. So you did it for a summer, huh? Yeah, I sold one vacuum cleaner. And how old were you then? Oh, oh gosh, I don't know. I might have been 20, 21. So, okay. Know. So I'm just going to read over a few of these here. Uh, farm ranch hand and dairy hand, carpenter, short order cook, delivery man for Sears and Olin Mills. Ah, oh, remember Olin Mills, mm-hmm. the photo package company. Mm-hmm. Uh, bartender, uh, a roughneck. For yeah. one day. One day? Yes. Actually, it was an oil well servicing company. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Those uh, went out with three guys out to way out by Wichita Falls. Yeah. I got the job through my mom who was working in the office there and they needed a hand that day. So I went out there, they gave me the overalls, the gloves, and we were pulling these rods out of a well. Okay. And, yeah. And those three guys uh, taught me something about the English language. <laughs> they taught me that the F word is a, as a noun, a <laughs> verb, an adjective, adjective, an adverb, and sometimes a proper noun. <laughs> That's a lot to learn. Yeah, in one day. and they were the most unhappy people I ever met in the world. So oh, yeah, my my, my time in the oil fields was one day, one day, period, and probably I said, there's got to be something better than this. Yeah, uh, no kidding. Uh, camp counselor, roadie, admissions ca- officer, which I believe was at Concordia, right? Yes, kind of one of your first roles there. Yeah, that was probably the first real job. Yeah, I, I mean. Yeah. I thought I was going into it as a career yeah. right out of, after college. Right. Uh, I was still doing production on the side, but, uh, you know, they put me on the road. It was my first public relations job oh, because nice. that's what it is. Right. Uh, you know, really I was out is. selling the idea of Concordia Lutheran College. Out yeah. There. We we're just turned four year or turning four year. You know, we had five majors, but three weren't even offered yet. Right. And so we had, you know, I could sell the idea of elementary education, business management. And people says, no, I, uh, no, I, it was management. Yeah. And the students would say, I want business. I said, well, management is business. They go, no, it's not. I go, yes, it is. <laughs> and, uh, communication. Yeah. But, uh, until John Fromm, who I hope you have on your show someday. I would love Dr. to Fromm, actually, that would be great. He's my mentor. Yeah. Um, until he came along, there was no communication degree either. Yeah. Uh, so it was Mexican American studies, elementary ed, or management. And okay. if you couldn't recruit somebody in one of those programs, you were kind of out of luck. Yeah. So. And this was about 1980 or uh, so. I think that's yeah. when four-year yeah, program yeah. got officially got yeah, started. It was I guess. during those days. But I, I drove a lot. Of, I drove every road in Texas. I think. <laughs> I I would stop at road, uh, you know, the historical markers and stuff. Yeah, and take yeah. the scenic route and everything like that. I ate uh, a lot of fast food. I was right. Had Florida was my territory as well. So I, Florida, yeah. Oh wow. And New Orleans. Oh my gosh. Wow. I could tell you stories about going to New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that for another show. Okay. <laughs> okay. So director of IT. Yeah. At Concordia. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, there were no computers at that time. Yeah. Uh, no desktop computers. Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, the first media lab, or the first computer lab was set up uh, through the education department, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Patchkey. Uh, and I helped him uh, set those up. And they were Macintoshes. Yeah. Yeah. The old uh, Apple II. Two, two right. E or whatever they were. Yeah. yeah. And um, it, uh, it's interesting. I'll tell this to my students. I was the first person. Uh, on campus yeah. at Concordia to have an email address. Really? Yeah. And I only had one person I could email. On campus? Oh, no, it was actually in St. Louis. St. Louis, okay. Yeah. Oh so uh, that's how old I am. Concordia needs to pay attention. He had the first email address on yeah. campus. That needs to go in a history right. book somewhere. Yeah, so a everybody campus. who got an email a- address after that were copying me. Yes, know? exactly. They were, they were trying to be like me. Yeah. The other thing that, I don't know if it's on there, but... Um, we had, uh, I'd gone to Dr. Martin's when we had the Peter center. I says, would it be in the school's best interest for us to get this, uh, broadcast license through the mm-hmm. FCC that was primarily for educational use? Oh, yeah. Uh, it was that, uh, microwave direct microwave, little dishes that you put on, not right. like the dishes we have now, but, yeah. um, and he said, yeah, I think it would be, we, we, all the expenses would be paid by this company that would we would lease our unused channel capacity to them, but we had to have certain amount of uh, distance learning put right. on this thing. And, and Martin says, we'll go to the faculty and get some guys to um, propose and write up the curriculum that we had to submit with the FCC application. Yeah. And I went there and they all just kind of, well, I don't know, we don't have time for this. You know, that's, that's just a fad. This, right. this alternative Passing learning fad. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it, anybody ever gave me permission to do that, but I just wrote curriculum. Right. The only, there was one professor that actually submitted his own. And, but anyway, I, I thought, Hey, you know, that'd make a good distance learning course. And right. so we uh, created the curriculum, submitted to FCC. We got the license and then that all started taking place. Yeah. Okay. And then 
when I went up to St. Louis uh, to take that job up there, David Kluke came in and he right. really took it yeah. beyond that. Yeah. Uh, uh, he really developed it well. But yeah. but right now to this day, I'm uh, funny. It's a kind of a bookend to that whole career. Is I'm still writing curriculum for distance learning. <laughs> I just finished uh, a course this year, uh, a public relations course. Oh, really? That's the one you helped me do the videos on. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Very good. So I'm still doing it. That's funny, isn't it? I love it. L- life is is uh, cyclical in, in yeah. so many ways sometimes. We come come back around. just want to note a few more of these. CEO of Parabolic Media and of Driving Hope of Texas, which I want to talk, talk about a little bit at the end, too. Co-manager of LCMS Servant Events consultant, film series curator, uh, a driver for Driving Hope of Texas, uh, also writer and professor, of course. So, See, Tim, I am a mile wide and only an inch deep. <laughs> so, you know, pick, pick anyone. We could talk about a lot of different things, but if you Absolutely. want a lot of depth, I mean, if you want an expert on any of those things, right. I'm not the guy. Right. You know? But you've got a little experience in all yeah, of that. I yeah. love it. Today, my guest is my former college video professor and mentor, Philip Holy, from Austin, Texas. You've had a lot of different roles and different jobs, but in film and video, you've also held a lot of different roles. A producer, director, writer, editor, a shooter, you know, you've done a lot of these over the years, which ones did you find were the best fit with your strengths as a creative? And, you know, how did you kind of arrive at that to maybe help others kind of find their, their point and their callings? I think I would not have been any sense of successful if I hadn't been a good cameraman. Yeah. I think I have a good eye for composition. Yeah. Uh, you know, I showed you my book here. Right. You know, yeah. pictures and taking them. Yeah. Um, we're referring to a special book that I published for my wife, Gwen, who's mm-hmm. retiring today, and she has not seen the photo book yet. By the um, time this comes out, yeah. she'll have seen it. Yes. <laughs> and so be in I hope, tears. hope she likes it. <clears throat> oh, she's going to love it. <laughs> so, you know, the, the eye was a part of that. Um, my weakness is audio. Um, mm. But... Over time, when I started moving and we were sort of rebranding Parabolic Media to be more public relations because we were, we were struggling with, with working for people who, who struggled with communication. Right. Okay. And, and I, I needed a way to invite myself earlier into the process. And I always felt like I, uh, I I never really considered myself a writer, but I, I could conceptualize and visualize and, and come up with, you know, just maybe that angle, right. You know? And so, uh, I, I, you know, through my education, I think I learned a little bit of that. I studied rhetoric in my master's program, which was helpful, um, to understand the art of persuasion. Hmm. Um, so I became more of a writer and, and, um, I would say a PR account manager, you might Mm -hmm. say. To yeah. say, here, you know, well, let's talk about the big picture. Right. And so I was hoping to rebrand it more in that. But uh, for some reason, I think the idea uh, kind of stuck that I'm the cameraman. Yeah. You know, I'm the cameraman. You kind of get labeled, yeah. I find, with, with the, yeah. one of the first things you do. Yeah. And people kind of hold you to that, even if your yeah. role has completely shifted right. after that. And, you know, I was, I was doing all this at the time. There was a major shift in technology. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, our editing first editing system I bought was over a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Tape deck. I remember spending 40,000. Oh yeah. Those things, the, beta cams were the expensive. border cam cameras were 40, 50,000. Right. Um, so it was very expensive. And then Apple came along my love hate relationship with Apple <laughs> yes, we and all they have that. put editings, uh, a pretty nice little editing system on every laptop for free. Yes. For free. And then these digital cameras became high definition. Oh, yeah. Anybody could do it. And so we were shifting from uh, people looking to me and say, we can't do this video without you, to people saying, I shot this video. Can you just give me some advice? <laughs> right. Tell me how I can edit this yeah. and make it look good. And, you know, that was a mo- the moment, you know, when I was dealing with, and they love their own stuff. Right. Oh, you, they, it was... <laughs> 
yeah. you know, my vacation videos, basically. Right. Let's make this into a mission video, you know? <laughs> I, you know, well, you're not going to want to insult them, but... Right. Um, so oftentimes we were fixing, you know, those mm-hmm. kind of problems for people. And I realized maybe I should go back into teaching. Yeah. You know? At first, I could see us moving into more of a consultant company instead of actual production. Yeah. And then I was also thinking I should be doing what you're doing here now, making my own stuff and maybe even selling it. Right. Yeah. You know, um, if I were to get around to it, but I was feeling the calling to come back to teaching. So that brings me a question that was submitted by Mr. Scott Maynard, also a former student of yours. Who who I asked him before the show here this morning, he texted him quick and I said, what, what are some other questions maybe I could ask Phil? And he said, uh, what inspired him to be a teacher? So this is a perfect, perfect lead into that. How, how would you answer that? I know you kind of give me the, the roundabout answer there, but mm, was there one thing? Satan? <laughs> That's what Scott would say. <laughs> <laughs> Scott was really good. He was, he was a co- co- comedian and he, he could he do is. imitation and he would always do the church lady on church, Saturday. Uh, oh, he did that so He well. still does this. I yeah. saw him last week and he did it then. Oh, uh, Yeah. <laughs> No, it was not Satan. It was it was God. Yeah. Um, I, you know the call. Any vocational calling sometimes doesn't come with a job. Right. Okay. And I think people going into church work have to realize that working for God and working for the church are not necessarily the same thing. Okay. Yeah. In my book, Leading from the Bottom, mm-hmm. I talk about uh, serving the mission or serving your boss, serving the organization. Okay. Yeah. Uh, organizations adopt a mission and you focus on that mission, but sometimes the organization lets that mission drift yeah. and they, they, they move from their mission right. and it causes conflict. So I had a mission, a vision for teaching and, and Concordia certainly had the vision that, that I wanted to teach in. And I was given the opportunity to teach. I just, even before I finished my master's, I was starting to teach you guys. Okay. I don't know. Somewhere in that time I finished my master's. Yeah. Then, you know, to go off to uh, be a practitioner instead of just a teacher for uh, more than 20 years. And then, and then feel that nagging call to come back that there was an urgent lack of understanding on communication from many of the clients that Mm. I worked with. Yeah. And they were young people just coming out of college. And I'm going, Hmm. Yeah. College. <laughs> That's the place. Yeah. You know, I got, we have one last crack at, at Christian communicators and that's in college. And so I just felt that calling and, and yeah, I toyed with the idea of maybe going and getting a PhD, you know, it never really was at the front part of my burner. But when I determined that, uh, when I interviewed at Concordia again, uh, that was the suggestion that yeah. if you're going to stay here and teach, you should get your PhD. Yeah, so I'm all in. Yeah. Uh, the tricky part was to find a place that would accept me. Right. I got turned down at the University of Texas. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, they turned me down from a master's program, so it was no surprise. Yeah. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't go there because um, basically, if you're not, scholars will know what I'm talking about. If you're not bought into the Marxist ideology mm-hmm. you're on the outside right you're on the fringe yeah and i didn't want to feel that way mm-hmm. and i was at a um uh a, a men's uh event the old um promise keepers up oh, in yes. dallas uh-huh. and i was waiting in line to go to the bathroom and then we were in the hallway with uh tables with vendors yeah. and there was regent university and i was talking to the representative while i waited in line i says hey do you have a, a phd in communication and they go yeah we do I go, really? I said, where are you located? I said, Virginia Beach. I says, oh, I'm not going to move. And I says, no, we, we can do uh, an online. online. Program. I go, oh, great. what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> Almost went in my pants. <laughs> and I, and I, I was late in getting started. I got accepted right away. And my gosh, what a life changing place that was. You know what's wow. interesting about uh, Regent University? What? When I was considering my master's, mm-hmm. there was a university called Christian Broadcast University, Pat Robertson. Okay, I was going to say, is and that... actually, one of my interns from uh, what I had in St. Louis mm-hmm. went to CBN to work for them. All right. Okay. Yeah. So I knew about it. And I go, ah, Pat Robertson. That's the what is that? The nine five hundred club, nine hundred, yeah, whatever. Uh, you know, four hundred something. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Club, right. <laughs> okay. 
Turns out it was the same place. Wow. Uh, they had evolved and they had become a real credible university. Yeah. And uh, the professors I had were top notch, the best professors I've ever had oh, in cool. communication. Oh my God. Hands down. Yeah. And the camaraderie, the 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 cohort I was with, they're still dear friends to this day. And oh, I'm actually cool. teaching for one of them online for Southeastern University. I'm teaching public relations for them. Oh, how cool. Yeah, one of my colleagues that I met down there. Again, the cyclical nature yeah. of things. Wow. Yeah. yeah so it was it was fun. Uh, that's how I got uh, back into teaching then. Yeah. And taught just about everything at Concordia. Yeah. And now I'm at Mary Hardin Baylor just teaching public speaking, which I never taught at Concordia. No. Speech even was though, a different... Even though, you know, Texas State was known for teaching... Mm -hmm teachers of speech yeah. i didn't want to do that yeah uh, but now i've embraced it totally wow and i've created an online version for mayor harden baylor which i'm teaching mm -hmm. as well as the face-to-face -face. and um for southeastern they wanted public relations which i'd only taught once before right but because of my experience with driving hope and with parabolic and and my business background uh and doing other things for parabolic media they said you're qualified wow and so um, I'm teaching that. And now I've written two online versions for them as well uh, cool. and teaching them. So it's it's been fun. Yeah. Uh, I get a little bit of variety, but then again, I don't have a ton of different preparations. Any teacher will know what I mean by the number <laughs> of preps you have. I'm talking with film scholar Philip Holy. You've written, you did mention uh, here, Leading from the Bottom. We can talk a little bit about that. But in particular, I want to talk about Lenses and the Filmmaker's Prayer. I've read Lenses. I was starting okay. to get through the Filmmaker's Prayer, and I just couldn't make it through because of my schedule here before today's put recording. Put you to sleep. May it put you right to sleep. I don't That's think so. That's the reviews I get. I read Lenses in two days. Yeah. I just loved it. Okay. I could have read it in an afternoon, but it just is fascinating. So tell me how well, these books came Yeah. About. First of all, I just want to say one thing about Leading from the Bottom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that book grew inside of me for many years. Yeah. Uh, I, in, at Texas State, my real emphasis in my master's program was organizational communication. Okay. And I could see organizations that were working well, and it frustrated me that our Christian organizations, our Lutheran organizations, our colleges mm -hmm. could never, you know, when you're skiing, you got to get up above the waves so that then you're efficient. What do you call that? They plane. We were always just choking in the water. Yes. You know, could, we could never get enough speed up and organization up to a plane. Right. You know? Yeah. And when I came back, I interviewed with Tom Seidel and I said, Tom, you know, you're this was just at Concordia yeah, University. Yeah. You, you, you've got this place turned around. Yeah. Okay, you'd gone through some tough times here. Mm -hmm. I said, did you fix those problems? He goes, oh, yeah. Well, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have a talk, <laughs> you know, and we have, I mean, it, it's right. funny. Uh, uh, there were any organizations going to still struggle with things this, particularly oh, sure. if you're in a turbulent environment. Right. And uh, so going back to my days at, at Synod, we were at a, a, a certain, some meeting that gave us a book and it was a, a, a book called boards that make a difference. Hmm. And another book, which became one of my things I consult on board training and that right. sort of thing. That's, the accident that got me into being the chair of driving hope and then the CEO of driving hope, because I went to train their board ended up being on the board. Right. Uh, but uh, the other book was um, Greenleaf's servant leadership. Oh yeah. Okay. That one. And I, read, I read this pamphlets they are easy to read and it just struck with me. And I came to the conclusion that one cannot become a servant leader mm -hmm. unless one is first a servant. Excellent. You can't yes. manufacture servant leadership. No, can't fake And then it. also the thing is that leaders tend to f uh, hire followers, not leaders. It's a natural thing. Yeah. Okay. And when they're, they're followers, who's leading? Right. Okay. You need leadership up and down the organizational chart. Yes. And so I, I discovered other people who were making a huge difference or let me put it this way in the past tense, they made a huge difference because you can't see a servant leader 
at the present. Right. You don't recognize them. Right. You can only recognize them by looking back. And there's this bubble of goodness that they create. Yeah. And they do it humbly and they do it earnestly and they do it in spite of a lot of issues. Right. And so I said, you know, when Kurt Sensky you had on the air, he yeah. wrote the book Life of Significance. And I told Kurt. Calling. Yeah. yeah. I said, you know what? That's a great book. I read it. And it's so meaningful. I said, what we need is a prequel to that book mm. when you're leading a life of insignificance. Oh, wow. Before you yeah. get to that. Yeah. Okay. And so I, I, I wrote this to encourage other servant leaders to say, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going to go on that's going to hurt your organization. But yeah. here's the good news, yeah. you know? That you can, through your leading from the bottom, yeah. make a difference. Phenomenal. And we need servant leaders at the bottom to lead. Oh, yes. I think today there's such an emphasis on, you know, being the, the, the top, being yeah. the, the, the be all, end all. Um, of course, with social media, everything's so self focused. And, you know, obviously the culture, whether it's shows on TV or YouTube, everything is centered around the, the self, the, yeah. the, the individual rather than, um, you know, being servant hearted, leading, uh, yeah. leading and serving others in the way that we lead. And the sad part about it is, I quote this in the book there's people writing out there that are very suspicious of servant leader. They're mm. afraid of them. They, they don't Interesting like them. Interesting point. Yeah. Because they're suspicious. Yeah. That mistrust. And that's very biblical too. Yeah, yeah. You know, right? That that we're going to be the the Christian is going to be persecuted. Yes. And and for for being who we are. Who we are. We're seeing more and more signs so, of that happening yeah. in our culture today. Right. Even so. But no organization can exist without servant leaders somewhere in their organization. <laughs> Film scholar Dr. Philip Holy joins me today to talk about meaning in film. Let's get into into lenses and uh, and filmmakers' prayer since they're so concentrated on film analysis. Tell me just briefly how you moved from filmmaking to film analysis. Uh, it was a graduate school thing, even though that had been inside of me. You know, I've been asking that question: How can people see the right. same movie and have two different interpretations, right. okay. including my own daughter? Oh, wow. We went to a movie together and we came out of there. We saw two different movies. Yes. And um, and so my graduate work uh, was pointing in that direction. Yeah. And when I finally got to the dissertation stage, I did the proposal. My advisor accepted it. Yeah. And we just took off from there. Yeah. I had been teaching media analysis and criticism at Concordia. Yeah. And um, the, I, I had the feeling... Um, that uh, that could be uh, made into more public, uh, uh, the general, the general pub public. Yeah, yeah, I can't think of the word. Yeah. Uh, that's the problem with the us mainstream writers. audience. We're always trying to find the right word. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and um, I don't know if I've got the timeline right, but I created the uh, course at Concordia Cinema and Religion, mm -hmm. in addition to media analysis and criticism. Right. And when we took those to the theater, cinema religion was always meant to be taught at the public theater, yes. uh, a movie house and eatery across the street. Right. It ran, well, gosh, how many years, eight years, nine years, eight, seven years. That something like wow. That. Well, that's great. Seasons. Yeah, um, was that it, um, it was a while. Yeah. COVID finally shut it down. Of course I was gone and Jake humans was teaching it, but I'd come back and do the, the movies. Yeah. Um, we needed something for a curriculum for the public. Yeah. And so I, I was immediately motivated to take media analysis and criticism and create a, a simple curriculum for that. Yeah. And I named it Lenses, 10 Different Ways to Approach a Film. Yeah. And, and the idea is, if you know what questions to ask, you can finally come to a more satisfying answer in the film. Yeah. For example, for me, whenever I watch an Oliver Stone movie, mm -hmm. I use the lens of accuracy. Yes. Because he JFK tells... JFK comes to mind. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Probably um, his most infamous example of, right. of taking some liberties with history. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and when you watch The Joker, the psychological lens seems to work very well. Oh, definitely. Okay. You don't need an accuracy lens, no. although genre is where everybody in the, the Marvel universe argues about... They're huge. It's all about genre. Right. Is this good 
in the genre? Does it fit in the genre? Is this a good Star Wars uh, movie or is it not a good one? You know, they right. all compare. Yes. So there's different lenses. And, and sometimes people use lenses that aren't as meaningful. And I wanted to introduce them to other lenses that could create some something more gratifying. To help the viewer be able to apply some of these to better understand yeah. the film and the meaning behind it. Yeah, and yeah. it works. I mean, my own family, my, my son, my daughter-in-law, her parents. Yeah. And Gwen and I meet monthly to talk about a movie. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, I love and, that. And the, the discussion would go for an hour and a half sometimes. Yeah. And at the movie theater, our discussions always after the movie, yeah. always after the movie where, where we would uh, spend time with, with comments and questions with the audience. And it's always so gratifying. Oh, yeah. Not only for us, but for them. It's fun to engage in that process. In fact, maybe when have you back for another uh, another episode here, we could actually do a film analysis. Maybe even have sure. a small group here or something, right. and having all watched maybe the same film, come back and put into right. practice some of your lenses. Almost right. like a mini version of your of your cinema and religion class. I think that'd be fun to do. On a, and so. and you're right. The uh, filmmaker's prayer was a sequel. Okay. Uh, yeah. it basically, I took the lens of ideology. Ideology. Where yeah. you don't. You don't need to ask the questions because you already have the answer. Yeah. Okay. That's what, that's the difference between a value lens and an ideological lens. Right. And in our case, that's the lens we use when we put a Christian focus on the film. Yeah. When we look for and recognize the religiosity in it. Right. It's not always Christian. Right. Yeah. Right. There's some alternative religious ideas that come out there, even in Christian films. Yes. You know, I can tell you some bad theology in some good Christian films. Right. Okay. Yeah, that'd be interesting. And but we discover that through right. that lens. So that's what the filmmaker's prayer is. And and you know, every filmmaker has a prayer for you. In other words, they have an idea, they have something they find important and they make a movie about it. And they want to share And they that offer message. it to you. Yeah. yeah. And and we ingest it. Yes. You know, that's why the cover, which I won't describe, but that's why the cover is made like it is. Yes. Um, it is sort of a mock up of a number of different pictures. I love that cover. And um and so those became curriculum for those series. And of course I put them on Amazon and a few people have bought them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we do the series, which I'm trying to get started in Wahlberg right now, I'm yeah. meeting this week, hopefully oh, okay. at the palace theater. I hate to say that too early, but there's right. a possibility we could be on the square in Georgetown doing that well, let me on know a Sunday happens. or Monday night. Yeah. I'd love to be a part of yeah, that. Yeah. It, um, it would be great fun, but, but that's what the books were for. And um, uh, my goal is to uh, raise Christian viewer critics mm -hmm. who can be trained to serve other people. Yeah. And I just read Dr. Gerald Kieschnick, former president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, yes. who yes. came to Good my man. Bible class at Zion Wahlberg, oh, wow. where I'm a member. Yeah. And uh, I was doing this series as a part of, as a Bible class oh, and his cool. latest perspectives, which is an email that he sends out, right. he does a wonderful analysis of a movie. And I'm oh, so proud gosh. of him because that's exactly. He applied what, one of yes. your lenses. Yeah, oh, yeah. I love he, it. He may deny that. And then the last right. thing, the book, the chapter in the book was uh, analysis of, of the movies from the mountaintop, Cody Benjamin. Yes. Um, yes. He's written a couple other books. He's written all sorts of sports stuff and everything. A dedicated Christian, uh, create got together a bunch of people to write different chapters and stuff, right. and it did a Q and A with people like Mark Wahlberg. Oh my gosh! Talking about movies and, and faith in that movie, so oh, it'd be fantastic. kind of surprising if you buy the book. It, it, there's, I I think it's a fantastic book. Mine is the least up. of the gems in it for sure. But what I did is I examined an influential movie for me that I I just love. It's called The Great Beauty. Uh -huh. It is. Um, an Italian director. It is in Italian. Yeah. It is the Ecclesiastes uh, experience for a man who has achieved much in his life, but now finds meaningless in it. And oh, he wow. wanders around the city of Rome trying to find meaning in his parties and in the church and other things. Uh, and and he, at the same time, he's discovering this this unfathomable beauty of life that he's just beyond his grasp. Oh and gosh. he finally finds the embodiment of it yeah. in, in a, I hate to spoil it. I'm, I'm Spoiler not, alert. No, I'm not going to spoil it. You're not going to do it? Okay. No, I'm not going All to. Right. Go, go but see it's the just, movie. It's both a beautiful movie, the way it's shot, the soundtrack is just amazing. Italian film. Beautiful. What, when was beautiful. it made? Do you know offhand? Um, it's 
It's probably about 10 years old. 10 years old. Okay. The Great Beauty or Great La Beauty. Grande Belizea, I think La is how it's Grande yeah. Ah, I'm going to have to check that one out. Yeah. And, and, you know, true warning, there's, you know, it's got a little nudity in it and right. a couple spots and, and everything. And, mm. pro- but, but that's the point that, that he's saying there's no, there's no beauty in this anymore. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so it's one of my favorites. So I did that for the book. Yeah. I explored it. So if you want to see one of my analyses, I would love of a, to read that. a more deep analysis than what I do in these books. These are just, I just use examples of, you know, maybe a scene here or there, right. A deeper analysis in that book, a uh, hundred movies from the mountaintop. From the mountaintop. Yeah. yeah. From Mountain. It's also available on Amazon. I will definitely have to pick that one up because that kind of fascinates me too. That's a great book. Yeah. It's a great book. And that just came out this year, I believe. Yeah. So. Film scholar and writer of Lenses and the Filmmaker's Prayer, Dr. Philip Holy, joins me today on Creative Christians. You know, in Lenses, you talk briefly about how movies are best viewed as a community participatory yeah. experience and certainly that is the case you know w- watching a movie in a theater with a group of group of people uh, today people are viewing films of course at home we've got great tv sound systems 4k you know uh, blu-rays and and great streaming quality post pandemic everybody's kind of learned to isolate more too so you throw that into the mix um other than maybe you know Top Gun Maverick now, which has started to bring people back to theaters, it seems, in droves for a very theater type of experience. What do you think about this trend of of the movie theater viewing experience as a communal thing? Is that something going to be something of the past? What's the importance and value of that for viewing films? Uh, I was saddened when the movie house and eatery changed ownership. Because the original owners were Christian. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they saw the value in it. Yeah. And uh, made it possible for us to have that series over there. Mm-hmm. Okay. The reason the series isn't over there anymore is they sold it to another company that's not interested in that. Yeah. But to me, these movie chains should be uh, encouraging that kind of community. Yes. Uh, because we'll come back. Because it's so much better. Right. So the, it, psychologically speaking, when you're hearing other people laugh or <gasps> gasp mm-hmm. or something like that, it, it does. It, it, let me put it this way. Uh, Albert Bandura's social cognitive theory basically says that we learn from observing other people. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you're learning about the movie through the people you're with. Oh yeah. Now that probably is very short circuited because we're not really paying attention to that. It would be more subconscious, but when we talk about it afterwards, yeah, that's where the real magic happens. Yeah. Because we'll see and hear things from other people that we didn't see. And suddenly we're going, Oh, I mm-hmm. didn't notice that. Yes. And together we can have a more full, complete interpretation of it. But it is it is marvelous to be able to go in and explore religious themes in movies because every movie has a filmmaker's prayer. I love that. Of some sort. There's always an ideological message. Message, yeah. Even just since reading Lenses, and, and oh, that was one of the lenses in there, and then starting to read the filmmaker's prayer, I've started to look at a couple films now since then um, differently already. And mm-hmm. so I'm finding that very helpful to help me focus more on that emphasis. Um, and then to the point of a theater and, and the community viewing experience, I, I, one of the most amazing ones for me in recent history was, oh, the last, um, Marvel Spider-Man movie. I think it was no way home packed theater. That had been an anticipated film. Everyone was wondering whether, Toby Maguire was going to be in this one. You know, the, the previous Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield, was going to be in it. And it hadn't really been confirmed. So you had a group of fans in the theater. It was just packed. And it was one of the most amazing experiences from a theater-going perspective because everybody in there were 
fans and so totally engaged. I mean, they were cheering loudly at moments. They were laughing. There were people even crying when uh, Andrew Garfield appears on screen. I mean, just the interaction of that for me is memorable. You know, and, and I enjoyed the film too, but they obviously were very <laughs> enthusiastic about it. And I just remember that experience because I haven't had one like that in a theater decades. And so it was so fun to be in a group with that kind of shared experience. Let me put it this way. Films are a gateway drug to religion because oh, interesting. especially you, you witnessed a worship service there. Ah, well put. Yes. They were worshiping and they were celebrating a yeah. resurrection. You might say, right? Yeah. You know, I'll C.S. Lewis uh, was not Christian for much of his life right. until he was well. And he was getting older as a professor mm -hmm. at Oxford when he finally, um, capitulated. He said he couldn't run from it anymore. He right. says his atheism was not supporting itself anymore. Right. right. His faith in atheism dropped. And then the door was open to Christianity to come back into his life. And what he'd said is as a boy, he was fascinated with the artwork that came with um, a particular rendition of some of the Norse mythology. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was a particular artist that drew these pictures and he was just so attracted to the, the beauty and the uh, uh, ec emotional expression depicted in these pictures and how they went with the story. And he was totally into that. Mm -hmm. And later on in life in mere Christianity, when he, uh, or I think it was mere Christianity, maybe it wasn't, he was, he was talking about his path. I yeah. forget which book it's in. Yeah. And he said, I realized later on that my, uh, exposure to those uh, mythic gods and Norse gods mm -hmm. and those pictures actually, uh, maintain in me a capacity for worship. Mm. that was finally there in place for me to be able to become a, a Christian again. Wow. So a true atheist won't worship anything yeah. except themselves. Yeah. And so even an atheist is, is walking around worshiping yes. all the time. And if they realize where the, the story leads and, and understand that there's a greater story out there, it connects. Mm-hmm. And so movies, I think, are the gateway drug to becoming Christian again for a lot of people. I'm talking with film scholar Philip Holy. You know, in Lenses, you have the chapter on the narrative lens. Okay. Um, the role of the hero. Mm -hmm. You discuss story building, provide some questions to ask in helping to analyze what is happening in the film. Mm -hmm. um, on page 36, you wrote, what new big question is raised in the end? The plots of good movies are not always tied up neatly in a bow. New questions, new callings, new communities, and new journeys may be introduced just before the credits roll. For some of us, our satisfaction in the narrative is supplied by these new questions. Does hope arrive for the sequel so the new questions can be answered? Or does the new question undermine or change the original one? In some cases, the neatly packaged answer to the question may be dissatisfying. And in your footnote to that last sentence, you comment, this is why I often criticize movies in the Christian genre that are all too predictable. So many make it seem that when one converts that all questions in life are answered fully and forever. These filmmakers seldom risk raising new questions. I think many Christian creatives would agree that, you know, you want the Christian genre of film films to be better than they often are, even though they have noble, noble intentions. Um, do you have a good example of a Christian film that maybe falls into, into that trap? Gosh, which one doesn't? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure the ones that I've been using examples completely answer that question, uh -huh. but I'm going to try it and maybe I'll formulate it sure. as I go. Yeah. Um, a typical one for me was the redemption of Henry Myers. It was a Western. The redemption mm. was kind of him straightening his own life out Yeah. more than any divine act of God. Yeah. You know, I watch that. And I, I kind of go, well, wait a minute. This does raise a question. Mm -hmm. Do I need Jesus to have died on a cross if I can do it myself? Right. 
And uh, so in that case, I think it raised a question it didn't mean to raise. Right. Okay. Another one that drives me batty uh, was I Can Only Imagine. Um, About the Mercy Me band? Yes. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a a subplot going in there. Uh, First of all, he's trying to make it in the music business. He's got this song um, that Amy Grant's going to put on her album and so right. he's finally achieving this stuff but the subplot or the parallel plot it was a relationship with his father and his father finally passed away mm-hmm. and they he had come to know jesus before he passed away and his son uh the the singer forget his name yeah I don't remember um he 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 rejected the idea that his father could be forgiven mm. Okay. So finally he comes to grips with that about the same time that Amy Grant is going to perform this song for the first time. And he's on, he's sitting in the audience and she invites him up to sing it. Okay. And so he's standing in the audience singing. I can only imagine. Now, if you know this song, it's about when you get to heaven, what will heaven be like? Mm -hmm. And he talks about seeing Jesus, but the filmmaker, as he's singing the song, puts his dad, in white clothes, he's imagining his dad mm-hmm. in the audience, smiling at him. And so the question that movie arises, is Dennis Quaid, who plays the father, yeah. is Dennis Quaid Jesus? <laughs> I think he might be. He's got the smile for it. Right. I think he might be Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, so your dad is, how, what? I, I don't get it. Yeah. Okay. So they they raise they raise that question and and uh, they missed an opportunity. Yes. Why don't you, why don't you make whatever visuals uh, support the song? Right. I you know mm-hmm. and that's true. I do find I think that that raises an issue for me. And a lot of these Christian films go for I hate to say it, but kind of the the cheap emotion rather than always earned. Emotion. They're they're a little more manipulated. It feels like I don't know if that's again always you know probably not their intention, but a lot of times it's a little more manipulated rather than kind of an organic right. experience that, right. that flows from the storyline yeah. and the characters. It's almost like it hits the beats. Okay, we right. need to make them cry now, right. rather than something that evolves right. out of something natural and organic. Yeah, and it's more rich for us when we discover it in sometimes the subtleties. Mm. Yes. You know, it may be just su- suddenly the wind starts blowing at the end of the movie. Right. Like in Bella, mm. one of my favorites, very powerful pro-life yeah. film. Yes. Uh, the Kite at the End. Oh, yes. You know, is is just a subtle reminder of how God lifts us up right. and, and protects and, and, and loves life. Yes. How transformation occurred in that. You know, God was not mentioned once in that movie, I don't think. But I would say it is one of the most affirming. By the way, there's another, I, I can't remember the name of the film, that one of the actresses in a film that is now being, uh, was very pro-life mm-hmm. uh, about a girl who was pregnant and had this baby and what she had to go through to, to go uh, by herself and everything. And now the actress is saying, I don't like people now interpreting this as being pro-life, that it, it, it's anti-choice. You know, and it's like, well, yeah, we did <laughs> interpret it that way. Right. Yeah. Of course, that was the filmmaker's prayer for us. Now, you're going to tell us that wasn't exactly. meant to be in the movie or that did, we're going to retract everything that movie did. Didn't oh, you read the script? <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should ban this movie because it's so pro-life. It's just like, well, gosh, uh, it is powerful. And you're right to, if you're pro-choice, that you don't want people to see this movie. Yeah. No. Which because is, it's very powerful. And there's a lot of good movies out there that have those affirmations. In oh, yeah. Oh, Terrence Malick's. Oh, mm-hmm. so full. I need to watch more. Beautiful, more. beautiful yeah. sentiments about who, you know, it's existentialist, a lot of it. Mm-hmm. But it's uh, existentialist in a Kierkegaard way. Yeah. Where he, he ends up being face down on the floor, just humbly before God saying, take me, mm-hmm. make me. And, or I've got to take a leap of faith. Yeah. And that's the hardest thing. If I take that leap, right. I'll have it, you know? I even think, you know, movies again, not, not, not religious intentions at all, but like movie poster, I've got up here for uh, the original Blade Runner movie for me was a, mm-hmm. 
amazing experience when I saw that in the 80s. You know, Ridley Scott's film about this, you know, dark future with Harrison Ford's, you know, replicant hunter, android hunter, detective running around a, a dystopian um, Los Angeles. Yeah. And, and you know, he spends the whole movie, and it's filled with violence, and there's some nudity in there as well, but... You know, he spends the movie trying to hunt down these, whatever it was, five or replicants. six yeah, replicants. Yeah. And, you know, in the big climax at the end, I don't think I'm giving any spoilers here. Most people have probably seen it. But big climax at the end, you know, he's hunting down the last of them, the, the deadliest one, is hanging off a roof. And at the, at the last second, this android, this non-human, has more emotions and saves him, you know, from certain death of falling down this this uh, high rooftop. Yeah. That moment for me caught me so off yeah. guard as a teenager because I wasn't expecting. Right. I thought this violent movie it's going to end in violence, and most mm -hmm. did. You know, you come through the seventies where there was just a lot of violent endings to films, and here you come to a moment, and all of a sudden the exact opposite happens. Right. It caught me off guard, and that moment sure. was just one of those things that kind of was a spiritual experience yeah. for me in a way. Wow, yeah. you know. Yeah, well, that that film is very rich in yeah. a lot of ways. We did that movie at uh, our Cinema and Religion, oh, which, I by the way, to this point, we've never repeated a, a movie oh, because good. there's so many out yeah. there. Yeah, why, yeah, why repeat one? Yeah. yeah. But one of my favorite themes in that is the relationship between the creator and the created. Yes. You know, who is your creator and what's your relationship to this creator? Yes. You know, do you rise up and destroy the one who created you? Right. Which the main character does, yeah. the main android does, right. uh, uh, Roy Batty, the right. uh, Rutger Hauer character. Yeah, I, I think there's so many layers to meaning that. Some people dismissed it, you know, with being kind of too simplistic or or – or whatever, or a visual feast, but I just find so many layers of meaning to that film. And it is a dark yeah. film, but it's uh, it's powerful on a number of different All levels. Right. So, Filmmaker and writer of Cinema and Religion, The Filmmaker's Prayer, Philip Holy joins me today on Creative Christians. How does your faith influence you and your creativity? You've obviously raised some examples here, but are there some ways that it has been an integral part of what you've produced over the years or what you've analyzed over the years or how you've taught? How does your faith influence you as a Christian creative? I think I'm going to frame it this way. For the Christian creative, we need affirmation to keep going. Yeah. We need to know somehow that what we're doing is making a difference in the world. But there's a danger from getting too much praise. Yeah. Thankfully, God has made it where I have not been, uh, you know. Overly uh, praised. Oh, yeah. And Tim, you're making it dangerous here by saying such good things about me, because now I'm going to get my ego going again. Um, you know, that's the thing for the Christian creative in, in their faith is, is you got to believe in what you're doing. Yeah. And people will tell you that it's nonsense, that's boring, that it's a mean spirited, <laughs> you know, intolerant, yeah. or uh, maybe oversimplistic on some occasions. Yeah. And you have to believe. You have to believe. But before you can believe, I think it's a starting place is you have to ask yourself, why am I writing this? Or why am I making this movie? Right. What is my prayer? Yeah. You know, what What do I hope to accomplish? And if it starts sounding like, you know, let's say the uh, approach with publishers. I think Kurt mentioned his relationship with his editors and that sort of thing, how he was rejected. Right. You can choose to go with the publishing route. I think you should go the the, the major publisher if you're into it for fame or, and sales, right? Yeah, right. But if it, it, you shouldn't let that stop you. You shouldn't worry about being rejected if your purpose is something else. And one of those purposes, and I think some of your other speakers have addressed this. Yeah. One of the other purposes is you just have to get this book out of you. It's It's bursting out of you. Right. And you have to do this. And and it doesn't matter how many sales you make. You just have to do this. Yeah. And because I think in a case like that, that's coming from your spirit. 
Right. And if if you're right with God and the, you can trust that that's the spirit of God within you that's driving you, uh, you got to get that book out. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if you print it on a newspaper uh, or a paper bag. Right. You know, it doesn't matter if anybody ever reads it even. Okay. And so that's why I, I, I had to choose the self-publishing and in a lot of ways, Tim, that's what parabolic media has become mm -hmm. a publishing company. Yeah. Uh, I'm starting to talk to other writers about having their works published by parabolic media. Oh, and I'm not that, you know, I get, I would get, I would pull out my marketing, yeah. my public relations to market their books a little bit. Right. Um, I'm just not that good at editing. Yeah. And so an editor is a potential barrier. They're, they're also can help you make this something so much better than it was before. Yeah. But I think your, your other writers might agree with this. Sometimes the editors don't get it. Yeah. And you want to bypass them. Yes. <laughs> you know? And so that, that can be either a moment of humility where you have to accept the criticism they will give you. Right. Um, but there's also potentially a time when you have to bypass yeah. the publisher and the editor. Right. And so, you know, the third way is to self publish. Yeah. And I chose that route uh, mainly because I was in a hurry. Yeah. I didn't have time to shop it around and I didn't think this book fit any of the publishers, you know, yeah, it's, it's maybe the, the, the two film books would have, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Yeah. But I, you know, I didn't see myself writing an academic book, even though maybe at one time I thought I'd write a textbook. Yeah. I would rather write something like this as more yeah. for the popular audience, whatever we wanted to call that. Right. So that's for the Christian creative. Um, you have to, you have to have that faith that what's stirring inside of you is going to, is for the benefit of others. Uh, there's nothing wrong with getting a publisher to do it and get paid for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. But realize that sometimes that calling comes in spite of the uh, financial or yes. popularity. It, it might even make you poorer and less popular. Right. But sometimes <laughs> you have to get that book out of you. Oh, yeah. Well, I can highly recommend Lenses, having read that. I, I just think it's fascinating. It does give you literally lenses to look at a film. And from as far as I'm into filmmakers' prayer so far, I'm loving this too. And it, it really is a deeper dive into that ideological lens. And I think it's fascinating as well too. And I look forward to to reading Thank you. leading from the bottom as well. And uh, I want to read that, that uh, Great Beauty article you wrote too, or analysis okay. of that film. So I look forward to that. Um, last couple of things here. Tell me a little bit about your involvement in Driving Hope of Texas, because I know that's been near and dear to your heart. Yeah, I mentioned that I went up to train their board as they were getting started. Um, Driving Hope is a non-emergency medical transportation service in Central Texas. Yeah. Okay. Went up there, and next thing I knew, I was CEO of it. We had no yeah. vans. We had no drivers. We had no budget. We started from scratch. Uh, the idea was my little brother's, who was a truck driver, uh, and so it was such a good idea, yeah. you know, and yeah. we realized after some trial and error, we realized that there is a huge need yes. uh, for uh, disadvantaged and elderly people, particularly uh, to get rides for their cancer treatments, dialysis, that sort of thing. Right. Wonderful. And uh, we went from in 2019, um, we went from giving like maybe that first month we were really starting to go, we had maybe eight rides. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for a month, mm -hmm. we've topped 300 rides twice now. Oh my gosh. And in that one week we had, um, how many rides? 75 rides, but that's a lot of mileage. That it's a, a lot, lot of gas, <laughs> especially these days. Yeah, with so the fuel prices. I'm still, uh, totally, uh, in love with this organization. I love the people. I love being a driver on occasion. Yeah. I'm no longer CEO. I stepped aside in retirement for yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I'm too busy teaching these days to really, it's grown. It needs somebody else. And now my friend, Les Winkler, which some people from Concordia will know, recognize that has name. taken on the reins of mm. uh, executive director of Driving Hope. Fantastic. So it, it's got a great future. Uh, there's such a need out there. If we were to go away, we would leave a hole yeah. 
and uh, so, definitely serving a need yes, there, and, and yes. uh, I suspect ministering along the right. way through that. That's phenomenal. So I told you I was a mile wide, but an inch deep. So I've dabbled in so many things, and that's one of the things I've dabbled in. So. I love it. But if you want to read Phil's book, listeners, uh, Phil's books, Lenses, Filmmaker's Prayer, Leading from the Bottom, they're all available on Amazon.com. Yes, including uh, the 100 movies from the, from the mountain top. top. Yeah, you yes. can find that on Amazon, uh, too. Which I also look forward Cody to. Cody Benjamin Cody is Benjamin. the editor and writer. Um, wonderful books about film and about organizations and serving uh, and film analysis. So all things to definitely look forward to reading if you haven't checked them out yet. Thank you, Phil. It's been Thank so you, good Tim. sitting down to chat with you, getting an opportunity to talk film, filmmaking, film analysis, academia, all this great stuff. Um, you've certainly influenced a great many students, uh, students' lives over the years, including mine, most definitely. Uh, I'm forever grateful for your instruction, uh, mentoring, and uh, the opportunities you've provided for me in both uh, academic and, and career as well. Uh, me going from a young, scrawny communications major back in the 80s uh, to, yeah, exactly. You look, you look a little skinny. bit like Harry Potter yeah. <laughs> back then. My my youngest son would have would have would love that comparison actually, <laughs> but anyway, I'm still living living that path of media today, so I owe a lot of that to you. And I'm glad that you're enjoying it. You're making a living and not cursing me for <laughs> oh, leading not. you down this path to destruction. <laughs> well, and I know many other former students listening today will feel the same way too. Okay. You've influenced many many students, so I'm just thankful our paths have continued to cross over the years since since Concordia. Once again, thanks so much for being yeah, on the show. It's, it's my been a pleasure. joy to have you. It's been fun sitting here talking. Dr. Philip Holy was inspired to become a filmmaker after seeing an audiovisual presentation at a church in the early 70s. He described it as a spiritual moment in his life. What a great way to begin as a Christian creative, inspired by other Christian creatives. Phil, in turn, then became an inspiration for me and countless other students who became creatives as well due to his influence. What a wonderful reminder of the potential influence you can have as a Christian creative on other people's lives. If God opens the door for you to be a mentor to others, or to inspire through your actions or your work as a creative, then step up to the challenge and your efforts will be blessed through God beyond anything you can do alone. People are watching you and your work. Make it a point to model excellence, not perfectionism, in your role as a Christian creative. It may well be your ministry. As a filmmaker, Phil has had the opportunity to engage in creating and developing media productions, films, and his own stories from which viewers can learn about something, grow, be ministered to, or just be entertained. He's lived the creative process of a filmmaker for decades now. As a result, he also came to an enlightenment about how different people can view the same film but come away with entirely different interpretations. Now, Phil in his role as film scholar has been working to raise Christian viewer critics to help serve other people in seeing the meaning in films through different lenses of interpretation. The idea of the filmmaker's prayer is central to seeing the ideological meaning in films. In a world that is quickly filling up with creatives, training Christian viewer critics to better understand what the storytellers of this generation are trying to say will only help us to better understand and communicate with them where they are. We are living in a time filled with storytellers. It may help us to understand their challenges, their joys, their pasts, their paths, and even their pains, but perhaps most of all, their stories in such a way that helps to elicit empathy for their journey and an entry point in which to begin conversations about healing and faith. It may even offer opportunities to share the love of Jesus Christ that may not be possible with them in any other way. Film is a powerful medium 
don't underestimate its power to communicate and its influence over many people, especially today. As Phil said, film is a gateway drug to religion. There are those who truly worship films, directors, stars, the storytellers themselves, as well as the stories. They may not be worshiping in church anymore, but they are worshiping at the altar of film. As Christian creatives, as filmmakers, we can help to tell stories that offer people hope and a gateway to the greatest story of all time. As Christian viewer critics, we can also help ourselves and others better understand, through the stories that films convey, the need for the true story of hope and redemption that can only come through Christ. Then we can influence the next generation and help change the world. My guest today has been filmmaker Philip Holy, one of the talented creative Christians who mentored me as a creative Christian in my earliest days at Concordia Lutheran College. Thanks, Phil. You've given me a lifelong career to date that has served me well. You can pick up Phil's books on Amazon.com and connect with Phil through his Parabolic Media website at parabolicmedia.com. That's P-A-R-A-B-O-L-I-C-M-E-D-I-A. Com. That's it for this episode of Creative Christians. Thanks for listening. Go to Apple Podcasts or whatever your favorite podcast distributor is, and be sure to subscribe to catch each and every new episode. I'd really appreciate it if after listening, you'd take a moment to rate the show. It helps me to gauge feedback and in rankings for the show as well. If you're really feeling generous, I'd love it if you left a brief written review as well. Let me and others know what you like about Creative Christians. You can also email me directly with your feedback, comments, or questions at tim at timristo.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'm Tim Risto. Until next time, stay creative and stay in God's Word. Blessings. Christians is produced by yours truly, Tim Risto. Special thanks to my guest today, Dr. Philip Holy, and to his wife, Gwen. And as always, a shout out to my lovely and supportive wife, Tracy Risto. Creative Christians is an audio production of Tim Risto Productions. Visit timristo.com to learn more. That's T-I-M-R-I-S-T-O-W dot com. <laughs>